Registrations are now open for the 6th Bioceuticals Research Symposium to be held in Melbourne from the 27th to the 29th of April 2018. Keynote speakers will include Professor Terry Walls, Dr Amy Myers, Professor Yehuda Schoenfeld and Dr Elisa Song. Book your ticket now by visiting bioceuticals.com.au and clicking on the Education tab. Medicine. I'm Andrew Whitfield Cook, and joining me in the studio today, I was going to say all the way from America, from <laughs> whence you, <laughs> you've moved, but you've now moved to Australia, Trudy. So, welcome to Australia, first of all. But let me introduce you to our listeners. Trudy Scott is the food mood expert. She's a certified nutritionist on a mission to educate and empower anxious individuals worldwide about natural solutions for anxiety, stress, and emotional eating. She serves as a catalyst in bringing about life-enhancing transformations that start with the healing powers of eating real, whole food, using individually targeted supplementation, and making simple lifestyle changes. She works primarily with women, but the information she offers works equally well for men and children even given the men's simple minds. (laughs) (laughs) Trudy also presents nationally to nutrition and mental health professionals on food and mood, sharing all the recent research and how-to steps so they too can educate and empower their clients and patients. She's past president of the National Association of Nutritional Professionals. She was recipient of the 2012 Impact Award and served as special advisor to the board of directors for many years. Trudy is a member of the Alliance for Addiction Solutions and Anxiety and Depression Association of America. She was a nominee for the 2015 Scattergood Innovation Award and is a faculty advisor at Hawthorne University. Trudy is the author of The Anti-Anxiety Food Solution, How the Foods You Eat Can Help You Calm Your Anxious Mind, Improve Your Mood and End Cravings. And I would warmly welcome you to FX Medicine in our studio and in Australia. Trudy, thank you. Thank you, Andrew, for having me. I'm really excited to be here to talk about anxiety today. Yeah. So we're going to be discussing neurotransmitters and anxiety. And I've got to say, we met you through Dr. Maya Shatrik Klein, who is just a lovely lady who has a different way of looking at dirt <laughs> as a healthy thing that we've just forgotten that it's not this horrible germ-laden thing that we need to avoid, but something that we need to not be um, mucky, but be not paranoid about. And so, you know, I've got to thank Dr. Maya Shatrik Klein for introducing you to us. Before we go into neurotransmitters, I'd like to get a little bit of a background because you've come from America, but you have a definite South African accent. Take me through this. So, So were you a certified nutritionist in South Africa, or did you gain that in America? I gained that in America. Mm. So in South Africa, I was working in computers, and that's oh. how I went to America. Actually, I met my husband on a rock face, and um, we had this big plan to go to America and climb. And right. so we were going to work and then climb for a year. So we did that. We went to America. I went as a computer programmer. And we saved up and then we hit the road. We bought an old Chevy camper van and we spent a year on the road rock climbing. Wow. uh, Climbing in Zion National Park, spending the night on a porter ledge. We did ice climbing. So we did the whole thing. So I would always consider myself an adventurous type of outdoorsy person. I traveled through Europe. I've actually traveled through Australia, you know, in my early 20s. And so I'm an adventurous kind of person. We went to America to have this adventure. And I was working in computers, working, you know, once we finished the trip, we did another three-month trip. And then a few years later, another three-month trip. So this was our kind of our lifestyle. Wow. But in my late 30s, still working in corporate America, I started to get increasingly anxious. Yeah. 
And, it's, you know, where did this come from? I'm an adventurous person. Why am I anxious? Why am I feeling this social anxiety? And then I started to get panic attacks. Mm. And it was terrifying. I had no idea where they were coming from. I, first, with the first one I had, I had no idea what it was. You know, I thought I was dying. I couldn't breathe. Mm. My heart was racing. My skin was clammy. I, you know, I've got to get some oxygen. I've got to get some oxygen. I had no idea what it was. And long story short, short I um, growing up in South Africa, I, we didn't go to the doctor a lot. We ate real whole foods, so I didn't even think of medication. And I worked with a nurse practitioner mm. and a naturopath and started to put together all of these puzzle pieces that were contributing to my anxiety. Stress was a huge thing. Gluten sensitivity, adrenal fatigue, heavy metals. Uh, I discovered I had this gene gene genetic condition called pyroluria, which was causing the social anxiety. And working with these practitioners and starting to delve into this, I started to figure out that it was my diet and it was nutritional deficiencies and brain chemical imbalances that were causing my anxiety. And once I started to address that, the anxiety went away. And I just thought, wow, this is incredible. Some of the anxiety went away, not all of it. It took mm. a number of years to get all the answers. But this naturopath that I was working with, she said, you know, why don't you go back to naturopathy school? I said, I'm really interested in nutrition. What about nutrition school? So I went to nutrition school to become a nutritionist, to learn about it for myself. Once I learned about this, I just thought, wow, this is incredible. Mm. And then I started finding out that more and more women were going through what I went through. Late 30s, going into perimenopause, all of these hormonal changes, increasingly getting anxious, panic attacks. And I started to think, well, this is what I need to do. I need to help other women who are going through what I went through. And slowly but surely, I've become an expert in this area, and now I get to help other people, other women, find this powerful connection between what we put in our mouths and how we feel. And it's so rewarding and so powerful. A couple of questions there. One that really peaked with me there is in South Africa, you don't see medical practitioners often. Why? No, we do. So there, there's the same medical, doc, you know, doctors offerings, and right, offerings right. there. Less so in the naturopathy world, and right. certainly less so in terms of nutritionists. But I just grew up. Uh, in my, you know, my mom wasn't a big fan of of medication and drugs. So I didn't think So you were well-versed in the naturopathic paradigms, if you like. You were quite open to it. I was. And Adele Davis was an author that mm. I read a lot. You yep. know, she was one of the first authors that I read and was really interested in the work that she did. So, yeah, I was just, I just sort of didn't think go to meds first, I thought, I've got to think of another reason why mm. this could be happening. And I think I've got a very curious mind. I always have had a very curious mind, and I've always been open to possibilities and learning. And that's the direction I went. At one stage when I did, you know, go to the doctor when I was working in computers, and my, I actually had this terrible cotton wool brain. I thought, I can't do my work anymore. And I went to the doctor and I said, I think I, you know, maybe I've got a have I got a brain tumor. They did a brain scan, nothing going on, and they actually offered me antidepressants. Mm. And I said, no. It's the only box. I, I don't, you know, this is not the problem. I need to find out. At that time I didn't know there was a term called what the root cause is. Mm. But that's what I intuitively knew. I needed to figure out what was the trigger. So you're one of these searchers. <laughs> it, I, I just I think it's an interesting divide. Like I, I was a I'm a turncoat. I used to hate, you know, vitamins. I used to lambaste them. Oh really? Oh yeah, I was shocker. Um, <laughs> and, and I mean that. I, I actually had to apologise to a friend um, whose mum was a naturopath. I cap in hand went back later. And I said I am so sorry for being so mean, and I was mean. <laughs> I was yeah, like a bully. And, but um, what I think is interesting is though. You've become an expert because you yourself have suffered that issue. I think it's really interesting how there are these practitioners who have become an expert and have really delved further than what most practitioners would because it's affected them and they know why it's bad, how it's bad, how it affects you. Whereas a professional, a health professional, and I'm going to just pick on them, <laughs> let's say a GP who has never suffered a psychiatric disorder but has studied psychiatry and K-N-O-W-S knows every term, every leaf of every book of their textbooks and the DSM, whatever it's up to now, they know that professionally but they don't know it intrinsically how it affects you. 
this and, and it's a sometimes can be such a real disconnect. Like, how do they really know how it affects you? And so therefore they just offer you a pill rather than looking into these lifestyle factors. And this is one of these frustrations with me. Do you speak to these people that are in that box and say, hey, listen, guys, you need to open your minds a little bit? And how do they respond? Well, there definitely are some of them like you who are turncoats. And that's one of my missions is be- is helping some of the psychiatrists, psychologists, uh, doctors become turncoats mm. because most people who have anxiety are not going to seek out a nutritionist. Mm. They are going to go to a psychologist or they're going to go to yes. a psychiatrist or their, their doctor, their GP. Mm. So if I can get th- them to become turncoats, then I'm, you know, I'm, I'm furthering my mission because then they will then help their people and direct them to nutrition. So, so that's that's definitely one thing that that I would like to do. There are some who are not interested at all, but it's very encouraging to see that you know the feedback that I am getting from practitioners because th- there are so many of them who are now open to this, and I think a lot of them are realizing that what they're doing is not working. You know, you can only give someone six or seven different SSRIs mm. or, you know, take this benzodiazepine and they're just not getting results to start thinking, well, maybe there's something else that I need to be doing. And those are the, you know, we welcome those turncoats um, in and say, yes, you know, this is, you've got to be open to it. I, I think it's thankfully reached that age that finally we're seeing more and more papers coming out that CBT, cognitive behaviour therapy and m- mindfulness have been shown to be av- as good as, if not better than some of these pharmaceutical medication um, interventions for psychiatric, call them a disorder. Um, so finally, we're sort of having to open up because people just aren't getting the results from the medicines. They've got a high rate of dropout because they don't like the side effects. But it's important, I think, you know, we can look at behaviour, but there's been some really good research like from people uh, like uh, Professor Felice Jacker down in Melbourne that are looking at nutrition and mood disorders and showing a definite improvement from a research perspective. You're now taking this to the people and the practitioners and saying this is how you do it, yeah? Exactly. And I'm glad you mentioned uh, Professor Felice Jacker. She's uh, one of my heroes. I actually got to meet her in December yeah. last year yeah. here in Sydney at an event. And she, the research that she's doing is just groundbreaking. Oh, absolutely. And the latest study that just came out at the end of January this year was uh, look, it was the first study, diet depression study. Mm. And they found a strong correlation between diet and uh, improved mood. Now, I, they, I would feel, you know, I'd like to just say that they, I feel that there's some limitations to the study because it all it was looking at was, and I shouldn't say all, it's a powerful change, mm. but they were looking at people going from a junk food diet, (laughs) crap diet, to a real foods diet. And it did include gluten. Um, it did. They did mention low-fat dairy, which I'm not a proponent of. And they do talk about, you know, you know, thinking about lean meats. Mm. And mm. they didn't talk about quality of food. So these are all things that I would say take it, taking it to the next level. We want to be eating organic. That's the next three million free. dollar study. It is, and it, she's getting there. You <laughs> yeah. know, this was the the sort of ground level yeah. study, which I think is great. Mm. Um, she actually reached out as part of the ISNPR International so- Society of Psychiat- Nutritional Psychiatry Research, asking for people to be interviewed for the media and I didn't have anyone in my community who could say they went from junk food to real food because they were taking it to the next level. They've got rid of gluten, they've, you know, eating organic. Right. But I did get a lot of feedback from people in my in my community who have been eating a paleo diet, caveman type diet, and have seen tremendous improvements, you know, off medications, no longer have a bipolar diagnosis, no longer have anxiety and depression. So I think we're heading in the right direction. And just the fact that we've got research showing this connection is so powerful. I got I got a you picked something there. I have to ask you, are you saying no longer have a bipolar diagnosis from a psychiatrist? That's what that's what this woman said. Really? Yes. Yeah. That's a powerful thing. <laughs> that's uh, you know, as I, I don't know how you get undiagnosed from bipolar. Wow, that's certainly controlled, but I've seen a lot of people with bipolar type symptoms get on a gluten free diet, and they, they, those their those swings go disappear. away. Wow! Yeah, very wow powerful. Way. So let's talk into let's talk about neurotransmitters because there are so many 
the age-old issue is measurement. And so the pharmaceutical thing has been try this because we've got no way of looking at what's happening in your brain. So we'll just give you something that acts on it and see if it works. Talk to our listeners. Help us understand neurotransmitters, assessment, what they are, what they do. So they're these brain chemicals that affect how we feel emotionally. And the, the one that we know most about is serotonin because of SSRIs. And you're right, the the thinking is you've got low serotonin, therefore take this SSRI and let's see if your mood improves, anxiety and the depression. There are others that we can consider. GABA is another one, gamma aminobutyric acid, which is our calm, one of the calming neurotransmitters. Serotonin is also actually calming. We know it more being beneficial for depression, but it's also helpful for calming. And with the low serotonin symptoms, we have the worry in the head, the ruminating thoughts, the reprocessing kind of anxiety. Whereas with low GABA anxiety, it's physical tension. We can feel it in our gut. We might feel this tension in our shoulders. So that's the difference between the low GABA versus the low serotonin and type of anxiety. And there are targeted individual amino acids that can be used to raise these levels. And you asked about assessment. How do we determine if someone is low? The, the way that I have found to be the most effective is a questionnaire. Right. And then a trial. Yep. So do the questionnaire for low serotonin. And I'll go through some of those symptoms. Mm -hmm. And then do the question for low GABA. And then try one of these amino acids. And the dosing is very different depending on each person. But there is a guideline, a, you know, a baseline that you would start with. So with low serotonin, you would fill in this questionnaire and rate your symptoms on a scale of 1 to 10. Do you have the worry? Do you have the ruminating thoughts? Do you second guess yourself? Do you have negative self-talk? Do you feel depressed? Do you have the winter blues? Do you have PMS? Do you suffer from insomnia? Do you have the afternoon and evening cravings? Do you have TMJ, rage issues, anger issues? So rate all your symptoms on a scale of one to 10. And then what you will do is say, okay, it looks like I've got a lot of low serotonin symptoms. Let's do a trial of one of the amino acids. Now, for low serotonin, we can use either tryptophan or we can use 5-HTP. I tend to go to tryptophan first. Mm. I have amazing results with tryptophan, but some people do better on 5-HTP. Yep. The concern with 5-HTP is there is one study that shows that it can raise cortisol levels. So if we know from a saliva test that someone has high cortisol, then we would definitely want to consider tryptophan first. So the starting dose for tryptophan is 500 milligrams twice a day, mid-afternoon and evening. And what I'll have a client do in the office or if I'm working with them over the phone is pick two or three of the symptoms from the questionnaire and say, we're going to do a trial right now and see how you respond. Because if you take these amino acids sublingually, you can get feedback within five minutes. You right. will start to notice something. Our problem in Australia is because of a manufacturing issue many decades ago now, three decades ago now, where they used a bacteria instead of a yeast. I think that was it. The bacteria caused a toxin, a toxic byproduct. It was not the tryptophan that caused the problem. But there was, I think there was three deaths. And it was because of the toxin from the bacteria. However, tryptophan got banned, as is always the case, certainly in Australia. And so tryptophan is not allowed in tableted doses. I think it's above 25 milligrams, but you can get powdered what, um, formulations for what's called extemporaneous dispensing, and you can use those. Um, I have to ask, though, before we go on, with those questionnaires, with those symptom questionnaires that you've got, how do we know that they relate to only serotonin? H how, who's vetted those questions? So these questions are based on the work of Julia Ross. Yep. She's the author of The Mood Cure, and she's a pioneer in the use of the amino acids and a mentor of mine. I actually spent two years working in a clinic with her, and she's been using these questionnaires for 20 years and I've modified them, tweaked them according to feedback that I've had from clients. And there's research for each of these questions showing that, for example, um, PMS is related to low serotonin. There's also research. Now, there's less research on the amino acids than we would like. Mm. But there's, for example, there's a wonderful study looking at tryptophan being used in the second half of a woman's cycle to help with PMS-type symptoms. So we've got research the supporting... PMSA, 
PMS anxiety type symptoms. Exactly, yeah, yeah. yes. So we've got research supporting uh, those sorts of correlations. Right, because our, our age-old problem has been how do you actually measure without doing a lumbar puncture, which would, would be devastating for many people. But, with it, you know, there's no direct correlation. There's no direct gold standard measure of what's, what is actually happening with that neurotransmitter within the brain, indeed within the certain cortexes. And the only sort of way that I can think of measuring it would be um, looking at um, ac- active MRI imaging. Yes, they do. There is some research looking at that, that but that's obviously not something that could be done no, you know, no, that would in, be a specialist. in a practice. But there is platelet testing available ah. in the US. I don't know if that's available here in Australia. Right. And there's with platelets, you can measure serotonin. And you can measure the catecholamine. So that's what, and there has been correlation with those and the questionnaire as well. Right. Gotcha. Okay. And I just wanted to mention something about tryptophan because you talked about quality. Mm. I have only ever used the Lidkey brand of tryptophan, L-I-D-T-K-E, because of this possible quality issue. And I've had a number of clients who've used other brands of tryptophan and then seen some benefits and then worked with me and we've switched them to this Lidkey brand and their symptoms have improved dramatically. And I actually had one client use a brand and they actually had some side effects from it. So I think quality is a really important issue. So I'm glad you brought that up. Mm. And using, you know, using something that we know is good quality is really important. Oh, absolutely. And then I've got to say, this is, you know, d- despite their faults, which are many, the, uh, <laughs> their inherent faults, but um, the TGA really is a world, the world envy in quality manufacture of supplements. And this is something that, that we just, it frustrates the hell out of me when you get people who continually, no offense to the US, but they continually quote quality issues that are based in the US and put it out on an Australian TV program as if it's got to do with Australian supplements. That is a lie. And they should know that. So there's only two answers for that. They're either dumb or mischievous. <laughs> so <laughs> they can take their pick, which that one is. So regarding tryptophan, you said 500 milligrams BD. The old thing that I remember learning was that tryptophan, you needed an insulin spike to help its absorption. Is that true? That can definitely help. So taking it with a little piece of fruit uh, can be beneficial. Now, when I'm doing the trial, I'll have someone open up the capsule and put it on their tongue. So you could mix it with a little bit of banana and the capsule, the powdered uh, uh, tryptophan doesn't taste very pleasant, so yeah, that's no. a way to you know if to change that that, yep. that taste, and then it does definitely help. And so they'll say, for example, when, while we're doing the trial, they'll say, "I'm feeling worried. I've been thinking about my daughter, or I've been having this conversation with someone at work, and I can't stop thinking about it, and I'm really craving some cookies right now." And we'll have them do the trial with the 500 milligrams there and then, and I'm saying to them, "I want to see how much your symptoms improve? Did they reduce by one notch, two notches, three notches? And within five minutes, I'm looking for an answer. This is how quickly they work because they're getting through the blood vessels in the mouth and then into the brain. And often I'll have someone say to me, could it really be working this quickly? You know, and they're starting to smile and they're looking relaxed. And I'll say, well, what about that that condition that you were thinking about or that argument that you were having with someone that you were worrying about? Oh, it's just gone out of my head. I'm not even thinking about it. And how about that that cookie that you were craving? No, it's definitely I don't. I'm not really thinking about it. So you'll get results that quickly, and that'll gauge how much someone might need to use. So over the course of the next week, then I'll have them do 500 milligrams twice a day if they saw quite a substantial improvement during the trial. If not, then I'll say you could try two in the afternoon and two in the evening. Now, there are some people who are called pixie dust people, and they are super sensitive, and 500 milligrams is way too much. And in that case, if they've indicated on the intake form that they – are affected by medications or they've been very sensitive to supplements in the past, mm. we'll just open up the capsule and I'll have them do a dab and just put that dab on their tongue. And mm. that can be enough. So it is very individualized. Has has anybody like, you know, let's say Ben Lynch, Amy Yasko, has anybody been looking at this from a research perspective? Because that's, being, that's a pharmacological response. That's a quick response. I would hope that it would be pretty easy to pick up placebo. I'm not a researcher. I'd leave that to the researchers. 
Has anybody done this? Is anybody looking at this? Using the sublingually to show an immediate no, but that's on my list to do is wow. to try and get something to That's published. something that needs. And there's actually some some good research uh, coming out on GABA. Yeah. Certainly there's a research in Italy that I'm corresponding with that I'm hoping we can get something going. Mm. And then there's a an addiction mood clinic in Canada that actually had a very interesting uh, paper come out. I don't know if it's been published, but it was certainly presented at a conference. Mm. And this was looking at postpartum depression. Yeah. And they had them use tryptophan and tyrosine five days postpartum and saw a huge improvement right away. Whether or not that was done sublingually or not, I'm not sure. Gotcha. But there is there is definitely more interest in this area and new new research coming out, which is exciting. Yeah. And w- w- I, I got to say, you know, like I'm already jumping the gun because pyroluria is something that I feel very ignorant about, suspicious of a little bit. I think people are sort of saying everything's pyroluria where it's not, but but I certainly think there's this real issue with certain population that they need help with. I think what happens, though, is we need people to be more expert in saying that's the pyrolurea, not this massive envelope, but that subset. So it would be interesting, I think, for people to read your book and to learn about how they can target at that more specifically, that area of, of true need. But what about, you talk about assessment. So question is, in Australia, we have the um, functional pathology labs and they look at metabolites of neurotransmitters in the urine, maybe possibly in the blood. Maybe that's some of the platelets that they're looking at. But what about the urine analysis? Do you find that correlative? There are some markers on organic acid testing that can be used in conjunction with the questionnaires. There's also, you know, I'm looking at things like uh, low zinc levels because zinc is one of the cofactors to make the neurotransmitters. Iron is a cofactor. So looking at that, those nutrient levels uh, together with something like vitamin B6. Yeah. Uh, which is one of the you know one of the things that we look at certainly with pyroluria, which is a very common issue that I see with a large majority of my clients. It's interesting that you say so many people are lumping you know everything into that bucket, but it is something that I see very common. And when you think of um, how common I've seen this correlation between pyroluria, which is the social anxiety condition, and introversion. About fifty percent of the population would be able to say I'm an introvert, mm. and a lot of those really? people, I believe it's not a personality thing it's a biochemical imbalance yeah. and when you address that with the pyroluria protocol a lot of them say I no longer feel like I'm an introvert I certainly can say that yeah. so is it personality yes some Amy of it says that but too. is it is it a biochemical well I will remember in my most orthodox of nursing training um, Robin Holden uh, our psychology lecturer Um, sorry, forgive me, our psychiatric nursing lecturer um, stated, I always remember this, it is only a matter of time before it will be deemed that all psychiatric disease will be of a biochemical nature. That was, that was, I I will, that's a quote word for word. It is indelled in my brain. Um, I always remember that lecture. And she was amazing lady. I think she's University of Tasmania now or something. I want to meet this woman. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she was a lovely lady. Lovely. Helped me through quite a lot. But um, so just getting back to those cravings that you mentioned, I also remember Dr. Robert Bust teaching me um, about the various types of cravings that people would have. And that was had some indication with regards to the potential imbalance of the neurotransmitter, one was serotonin, one was tryptophan, one was carbohydrate, the other one was protein. Now that was decades ago. How is how's that correlation of uh, cravings evolved? What do we see now? So with each of these different areas of brain chemical or neurotransmitter imbalances that I look at, there's yep. an associated craving. Mm. So I'll, I'll say to my clients, what is your drug of choice? Is it sugar? Is it bread? 
Is it uh, maybe it's a pain medication? It's something that makes you feel good. Is it a street drug? Mm. Is it caffeine? Is it chocolate? You know, it can be anything. Yep. And then think about how you feel before you need it. And then how do you feel afterwards? Yep. So if we look at the five different areas of brain chemical imbalances that I look at, we've got low serotonin. In that case, it's a craving for carbohydrate and it tends to be afternoon and evening because our serotonin takes a dip at that time. If it's a low GABA, which is physical anxiety, then it's a stress eating. Maybe you eat, you drink a glass of wine, that's your drug of choice, and it relaxes you. Then there's also the low catecholamines, and in this case, it's often coffee. You're craving something to give you stimulation. You're craving something for focus and for energy. Some people may go for candy to give them that sugar. Right. Then we've got the low endorphins cravings, and with that, it's the craving for comfort, reward, treat. Yep. I deserve it. I love chocolate chip cookies. I love a bowl of ice cream. That's low endorphins. And for each of these, there's an associated amino acid that raises the brain chemical, gets rid of the mood problems, and then gets rid of the craving as well. And then the fifth area is low blood sugar. And this is obviously adding in protein at breakfast is going to help, but then using the amino acid glutamine can completely stop those cravings in their tracks if it's low blood sugar. And opening up a glutamine capsule or using glutamine on the tongue will completely remove those sugar and, cravings. And glutamine versus glutamic acid? Glutamine, mm. yes. And that's because of the size of the molecule. So <laughs> glutamine changes to glutamic acid um, outside of the body but you need, I better get this right, <laughs> you need glutamine to cross the blood-brain barrier. Yes. yes. And some of that glutamine also converts to GABA, so it can be calming as well. Right. Now, I have a question about GABA, and that is that the, the small amount of research that I've read on GABA was that particularly to do with oral administration of GABA was that it really didn't have an effect on um, brain GABA, that it worked via a gut type mechanism for stress. And, and that's where my placement is. Help me with this. Uh, it, does it get absorbed? Does it work on, a, on the gut brain access? How is it working, if at all? It's such a great question, and it's something that it's probably the, the the question that I feel the most on Facebook or on my blog really? or okay. via interviews because so it's many not people just me. Good. no so many people <laughs> will say it definitely doesn't work. Firstly, that's one of the at least you saying it works in a different mechanism, you know, through the gut and the gut brain axis. But a lot of people will say don't even bother using it; it's not going to have an impact. Yeah. And it was a lifesaver for me personally, so I found the effects. You'll yeah. often hear people say it only works and will only get through the brain if you've got a leaky blood-brain barrier. Ah, right, so yeah. I, I don't, we don't have enough research to how confirm you, that. How it, yeah. So they, we just, you know, looking at old research. So as soon as I get asked questions, I start digging because mm. I've got this curious mind. So I've been looking at a lot of the research and there's a lot showing that we've got these GABA receptors in different parts of the body. We've got them in the endocrine system. We've got them in the pancreas. We've got them in our muscles. So is it, you know, having an effect at a peripheral level rather than getting into the brain? There's also this uh, Italian researcher that I mentioned, and I can't think what her name is offhand, but she's got some papers looking at talking about the possibility that it is actually getting through the blood-brain barrier. Whether And she doesn't mention the fact that the blood-brain barrier may be compromised. And then she also talks about the vagus nerve and the gut-brain connection. So right. we just don't know enough yet. But you you know you just got to talk to people who've tried GABA and seen the effect. Yeah. Now we'll say that it seems to be most effective taken sublingually. Now I'm going to answer that one. I'm going to have a stab at this because we think oh physio um anatomy is anatomy and we know what you know we know that we have two elbows and we've always known that we have two elbows because we have two elbows. Well, guess what? They've only just found a sort of accessory, perhaps a pathway or an entry pathway through the blood-brain barrier via the lymph. And how do we take these sublingual um, medications? What, where do they get absorbed? Into the blood and into the lymph. They bypass the portal system. Hmm. <laughs> so perhaps the problem has been why GABA has not been using is because we've been doing oral dosing. So I've got to ask you, did you do oral dosing of GABA or sublingual dosing? Personally, myself. Yeah. So my top nutrient that I use for GABA is an over-the-counter product 
can I mention the name? Source yeah. Naturals called Gabba Calm. And it's the, the reason I use it is Julia Ross taught me that, you know, we used it in, in her clinic. And it's very nice, firstly, because it is sublingual and it's a small dose. A lot of people will jump to 500 milligrams or 750 milligrams because that's what's available, certainly in America, in, in the stores. And I mentioned earlier about some people being sensitive. 500 milligrams is often way too much for the average person. Gotcha. This source natural sublingual is 125 milligrams, and it's got a tiny bit of tyrosine in there, just 25 milligrams, which counters some of the sort of relaxing effects of the GABA, so it's not too relaxing. So, yes, I used sublingual GABA, and it's the one that I use with most of my clients. Now, there are some contraindications with tyrosine, certainly if you've got melanoma or high blood pressure or but migraines. 25 milligrams? Usually right, it's really? fine. Usually yeah. it's fine. This <laughs> I one, don't know how you going to avoid 25 milligrams of tyrosine in your diet when you got melanoma. You know, that's it's like, true. It's just a precaution. Yeah, it's just a yeah. precaution. So I, they, if they didn't use that, I would have them do. I've got a nice product that I found that has 200 of GABA and 200 of theanine. They open oh, that nice. and put that on their tongue. Yeah, and that they're getting those results. Yeah. By the way, we get it. We've got some nice extemporaneous products in Australia now, and yes, they're powders. But if if one is can be bothered, please to measure with a good measuring device. You can buy them on Amazon. You can buy them on eBay. Um, a nice um, sensitive measuring set of scales. Um, the results that you can find by personalizing your medication doses with patients can revolutionize your clinic. Thank you, Penelope North, who taught me this. Hello, Rusty. Call out to you there. Um, she was an amazing practitioner in Brisbane. Um, she, and she did extemporaneous dispensing years ago. Decades ago. I love it. I think that's so perfect because oh, there's so no one time. size fits all no. for anyone. It's no. very individualized. Yeah. And I love that that my clients can try something and get the effects and then adjust accordingly. So yeah. I'll have them keep this food mood log and they'll be writing down how much they used doing one at a time so they can gauge, is it the tryptophan that's helping? How much is it helping? And then we'll add in the GABA and then we maybe add in the DPA or the glutamine, but one at a time so they can gauge. And yeah. it's so powerful for them to feel the results and to feel empowered and to feel in control instead of being told, take this, go away and come back in a month and then let's see how you're feeling. They can actually adjust accordingly. I've got to ask the devil's advocate question here though, and that is that I'm always very cautious about, am I really seeing that result in my patient? Indeed, is my patient really experiencing that or are they, is that that high placebo rate, particularly in an emotionally charged condition? So do you ever correlate this sort of thing? Admittedly, these aren't medical gold standards. I get it. But at least if we started to show correlation between what we thought we're seeing as a symptom benefit and then measuring that with a platelet benefit, to me, that is the groundwork that needs to be done to say, yeah, well, there is actually a correlation there. That grows. And then we get a base of evidence to say, shove that up, up your jacksie. You guys really need to open up your minds. You know, what you thought was true is not true. Um, then we can buck the system. I agree. I agree. We need the research. We definitely do. And as I said earlier, when someone says to me, could this really be working so quickly? Mm. Is it really the amino acid or is it because I'm sitting here working with someone who cares about who cares? me and helping? And to me, if they're feeling better, that's great. But I agree we need this research to start showing this. And, you know, when I'm – I'll give you an example of something that really – blew my mind. I mostly work with women mm. uh, in their late 30s, 40s, 50s. And so they can, you know, articulate, you know, maybe it's because you, you're trying to help me. But I worked with uh, the, the child of a mom that I was working with. And she was a 10 year old kid who had no idea what we were doing. And I was talking to the mom and she had this uh, terrible, terrible rage issue. She was actually diagnosed with reactive attachment disorder. Such wow. bad rage issues, anger issues, explosive, so bad that, you know, their mom had to physically s almost sit on her to hold her down when she was having one of these rage issues. And it turned out she was anemic. She had gluten issues. And she we've discovered she needed some serotonin support. But yep. the way I figured this out is... As I normally do, I wanted to do a trial. She loved candies. And we were, I'm talking to her and we're trying to figure out where she was on the scale of loving candies. And turned out pretty high, didn't want to talk to me, sitting in the office on a swivel chair. And I said, you know, how would you feel about giving up candies? 
didn't want to know about it, turned her back on me, didn't want to hear about it. So I continued to talk to the mom, get more information, and I took out a 100 milligram of a chewable tryptophan, and I said to this little girl, would you you know, be willing to try this, and then we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about everything else later. Mm. So I gave her this chewable 100 milligram tryptophan. She was sitting on her own. Within five minutes, she turned her swivel chair back to me, smiling, and she wow. said, I think I could, I could give up the candies. In five minutes. Now, wow. here I was a little kid who didn't know what we were doing. Yeah. There was no placebo effect. And that, addressing the low serotonin with the tryptophan, getting her off gluten, getting some additional iron in her diet. She actually needed an iron supplement as yeah. well. Yep. This little girl was an, a new kid. Wow. Way. So. Wow. <laughs> that I, that needs to be written up, I think, the, and this, in the literature, because then people can start to see the kind of results that yeah. they're seeing. You and I are definitely going to be podcasting again, Trudy. Now that you've moved to Australia, you won't you won't be able to let go. Good. You won't. I'll I'll stalk you. <laughs> <laughs> but I think it's really interesting. But practitioners start to get a bank of case histories so that they can feel that there's a consensus, if you like, out there that it's not just one. It's not just me. It, this really is coming from sort of several ports saying, yes, there really is a clinical effect. Because for me, we can all feel nice and rosy and good. It's all about the, the patients. And, you know, somebody with anxiety, unless you've suffered anxiety, as, as you have know well, the feelings of doom, the feelings of death, of that incredible fear, um, Unless you really know what somebody's, unless you've walked in their shoes, you know, you really don't know what they put up with. So we really need that sort of bank of, of, um, of evidence to sort of make a consensus. So talk, talking about sleep patterns, can you take me through sleep patterns and what happens with the neurotransmitters here? So we can have sleep issues with some of these neurotransmitter imbalances. Certainly low serotonin is a classic one. If you are... You've got a client or a patient who's not able to fall asleep or waking in the early hours, that can be low serotonin. And using tryptophan at night can help. Some people need maybe one in the afternoon for the anxiety type symptoms, and they may need two of the 500 milligrams at night time. Then we could have low GABA. If they're lying awake in bed tense, that could be a need for GABA and using some GABA and a higher dose at night time. You may be able to get away with 500 milligrams at night. Low blood sugar also needs to be considered. If someone hasn't had a good breakfast with protein and they've had these blood sugar swings throughout the day, that can actually affect their blood sugar levels yeah. and wake them at night. And then the other area that I always look at with sleep is high cortisol because you can have the shift in the circadian rhythm where your cortisol goes high at night and no amount of GABA or, or tryptophan is going to help it if you've got high cortisol. So you need to address that. And I like a product, uh, it's a not phosphatidylserine, it's a phosphorylated serine, which helps to lower that high cortisol. There's also a really nice lactium product, which is a hydrolyzed mm. casein, mm. which helps to lower that high cortisol, and that can help people sleep. Yeah, but there's this real, a real ignorance um, between what is, what is dairy what is milk? And, you know, and they're like, for instance, whey has different actions from milk. Somebody can be sensitive to both, but just because somebody can't handle milk or doesn't want to eat milk doesn't necessarily that you need to avoid all milk based products like this alpha casein. A absolutely. Uh, have I got that right? Alpha, hydrolyzed casein. Uh, hydrolyzed casein. Forgive me. I've got an alpha casein as a A2 milk. Forgive me. Beta casein. Um, so it has, I mean, it's got great attributes. It's really wonderful. What about things like minerals, though? And indeed, herbs, beautiful herbs. You asked about minerals. Yes, about minerals. Now, the classic flagship to help you relax at night has been magnesium. I've always tried to tie that in with the nocturnal leg cramps and indeed the, the ocularis um, muscle flickers. Not always evident. Seems to work. What do you use? How high do you go? 
So I think magnesium is such a common deficiency and most people can benefit from it. The other thing is uh, it does help relax people. Um, and then we've got, you know, it helps, can help with uh, bowel issues as well. So, and that's a common issue with a lot of people. Mm. I like a chelated magnesium, like a magnesium glycinate. For calming effects, uh, magnesium threonate seems to be pretty good. Mm, can't wait till this is available in Australia. Yeah. yeah. And then, you know, I mentioned earlier some of the cofactors like vitamin B6. And if you're doing higher doses of vitamin B6, which I find a lot of my clients do well with, you need to make sure that you've got enough magnesium on board. And then the other mineral that I really like is zinc. And that is such a common deficiency, you know, depleted by stress and depleted by sugar, depleted by exercise. and Depeted, Depleted by flour because they mill it and they lose the zinc and give you cadmium instead. Thank you very Lovely. much. Lovely. <laughs> so getting good levels of zinc is, you know, important to address as well. And we've got this zinc-copper imbalance. And if your zinc's low, obviously you're going to have higher copper and then more anxious. And interestingly enough, I'm seeing a lot of people who are on a paleo diet becoming depleted in zinc simply because they are replacing their breads and their cookies with nut flours, baking with nut flours. Mm. And these nuts, consuming those large amounts of nuts in baked goods means they're getting higher than they should normally be getting. And we've got this copper from the nuts. So I'm oh. seeing a lot of people reporting that, you know, they're, they're thinking their zinc levels are low. So pecan nuts were traditionally the the zinc type supplement, pecan nuts and pepitas, pumpkin seeds. Pumpkin seeds I like because yeah. their they ratio of zinc to copper is a little bit better. Or get them on oysters. Yes, definitely. <laughs> as long as they like oysters. Or eat grass-fed red meat. You know, yeah. that's a wonderful source of zinc. Yes, and that's a real actually salient point. It must be grass-fed. Absolutely. Otherwise, there is no point. Exactly. Yeah. So I want to talk about different forms and different ligands of minerals because, you know, there's been this move away from the old forms of vitamins into the new, the active forms. And we've seen this in the folate metabolism, certainly. The first one off the rank was actually B6 in Australia. So it was pyridoxal 5-phosphate. And I remember this, to me, it was a wishy-washy term. They said, oh, it's 10 times as good. Show me that evidence. There's, there's no evidence on that. What I think is interesting, though, is that pyridoxine or pyridoxal, or pyridoxamine, has to be phosphorylated by the liver. So the issue with giving perhaps, you know, the old form of pyridoxine hydrochloride to somebody that has a compromised liver function, they are the ones that might not be able to do it. Now, I've seen, certainly seem to have seen issues with hepatitis, chronic fatigue, lots of drugs, that sort of thing. But do you tend to use pyridoxal 5-phosphate and just not even use pyridoxine hydrochloride? So I use both. Hmm. The other questionnaire that I use is the Paraloria questionnaire and we talked a little yeah, bit about so that. So everyone yeah. will do that yep. and most of my clients seem to have a need for vitamin B6 and the classic clue that it might be low B6 is the poor dream recall. So they're not remembering their dreams. And there's only one study on that one, and it's a little bit of an iffy study. So we definitely need some more research in mm. that area. But mm. the, a lot of people do well with uh, with just regular pyridoxine and starting at 100 milligrams, going up to 500 milligrams. If we're not getting results there, and that would be the dream recall should be coming back. They should. It's, it's helping to make GABA. It's helping to make serotonin. So they should start to feel some of that calming effects. And it helps with the social anxiety big time together with the zinc. Then we will, then I'll switch them over to the P5P. If they've used B6 in the past, the regular pyridoxine, then it will just go straight to the P5P. Gotcha. So it, and it, some people do well with a combination, a little bit of each. So I think it is very individualized. And, you know, cost is a factor. The, the P5P is more expensive than the, the B6. It's the new kid on the blog. So if, if someone can get the same benefits with a more affordable product and then use that money somewhere else, that's what I'm also thinking about mm, as well. Perhaps for good fresh food. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> um, I did want to raise a, a, a red flag and only basically to destroy a myth. I see a lot of practitioners being extremely paranoid about high doses of B6 because of an extremely rare, and I mean extremely rare, problem with it, and that's the peripheral neuropathy. I, I then have to think about interactions, but it seems to occur extremely rarely. 
I haven't done that search on the DAEN. I think I will. Um, but I've only noted it like once or twice in research papers. Do you ever see it? I have not seen it. I've had a few clients who've said they've got an inkling of it mm. and then we've just cut back and it's completely gone away. So I am cautioning them about that. And Do you ever think, f sorry to interrupt, but do you ever maybe uh, augment with um, B12, which can actually help in paresthesia? Yes, yeah, that? definitely. So that would be something else that we're looking at is low B12 and a lot of people, yeah. are, are, you know, we'll do blood work. In that case, I look at B12, methylmalonic acid and homocysteine in conjunction with symptoms on a questionnaire and then also some of the, the genetic markers as well. Yeah. But um, yes, yeah, so that would definitely be something that you want to do. And I, I'm glad you brought it up because a lot of practitioners are very cautious about higher doses of uh, vitamin B6. I've and never, never seen an issue. But I must admit there are some uh, people in, there's a group, a uh, Facebook group for people with Ellis-Danlos syndrome. And there are some, there have been some questions about a few people having some effects from high levels of vitamin B6. And it may be just this subset of yeah. people. And I actually did a blog post on showing this connection between pyroluria and Ellis Danlos syndrome. And a lot of people who get on the pyroluria protocol have noticed that their symptoms improve when they're on the pyroluria protocol. So it's pretty interesting the connections that we're seeing with pyroluria and some of these other conditions like yeah. Ellis Danlos, like dystonia. Um, there's a condition called Alice in Wonderland syndrome right. where uh, people uh, f f see, see everyone around them as tiny little, you know, little Alice in Wonderland creatures. And How the cool. pyroluria <laughs> protocol has, I don't mean has to helped. That. So, right. so it's very interesting that there's these correlations with some of these other conditions. A yeah. little bit of a tangent there, but I thought it was no, quite but that, fun. <laughs> well, it's actually important to know about these very rare things. And to know that they're rare, like, for instance, who would think of worrying about vitamin C just because somebody had a um, G6PD deficiency? You know, high doses of vitamin C can actually send them into a cascade. So who would worry about that? These people have normally found out through some other avenue. I think, though, it's worthwhile due to your expertise to note these so that people can go, red flag, I remember that so that they can make appropriate adjustments to their therapy. So it's actually great to know. Trudy, I thought this was going to be a rather simple podcast and speaking to you and knowing about now some of your expertise to the point where you look at even ligands and how much and dosages and dose, not just dosing frequency, but dosing timing. There's so much more to cover. There is so much more to cover. Would you be amenable to join us back on FX Medicine at another time and we can look at some other areas? I would love that. Because we've covered on, you know, we've covered off on serotonin. We've covered off on GABA. I think there's some more to cover off with GABA. I want to also get into things like histamine. Um, I also want to get into things like what happens with other mood disorders, not just anxiety. So would you be amenable to join us on a second podcast to cover off these subjects and more? I would love it. I've thoroughly enjoyed today and I would love to continue. Absolutely <laughs> true. I've got to say, it's like, seriously, I could make this into an hour, you know, three hour podcast, but I don't think our listeners have that much time. So we will invite you back and we will continue with part two on a second occasion. So thank you, Trudy Scott, for, enjoying, for joining us in the studio today on FX Medicine. Thanks, Andrew, for having me. This is FX Medicine, and I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. Hi, I'm Andrew Whitfield-Cook. At FX Medicine, we strive to be clinically relevant for you. So please get in touch with us if there's a topic you'd like us to explore or a specific expert you'd like us to interview. You can email info at fxmedicine.com.au or contact us via Facebook, Twitter and Instagram.